This is Advanced Patterns with IO Read Writer. I am Paul. Uh, I am a software engineer at Weaveworks. And my goal for this talk is that after it, you'll be able to say that it's not actually that advanced. It's pretty obvious once you have the tools. We'll start with some basics, uh, go over what's available, the bits we'll be using, and then we'll build up to more interesting things as the talk goes on. There'll be quite a lot of code, and we'll go through it pretty quickly. The slides will be up at the end. If you can't follow along, that's fine. Uh, first, a word from our sponsors. Uh, not actual sponsors. Uh, I work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, we build a simple, portable, and reliable way to network and manage containers and microservices. Uh, we do a lot of Go. So, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this talk isn't about this kind of reader. I wish it was. It'd be way better. <sighs> so let's start with some basics. What's available in IO, Buff IO, and IO Util? Uh, the simple answer is that there's a lot of building blocks. They're great examples, and they're a set of tools that can help you design your code better without necessarily compromising on performance. Uh, this talks about these guys in particular. Reader and writer, you've probably seen them in your code a lot, uh, but you may not have necessarily done a lot of work with them. Uh, read writer, in general, is one of the most powerful abstractions available in Go. It's simple, expressive, composable, and interchangeable, like the best abstractions. Uh, so some of the tools that we have for working with them include things like IO copy, limit reader, T reader, buff IO scanner, discard, and there's loads more in the standard library. They're all over the place once you kind of see them. We'll be working with some of these today. Uh, there's a very good analogy in a lot of these to Unix pipes, if you use those. So things like cat, head, tail, T, all that. Uh, so let's start with a bit of basic composition of them. So building your own ab abstractions around readers is really easy, and composing them is pretty easy. Uh, they're very good for interchanging, so let's look at some basic usage. Um, so we can declare a IO reader, and we'll just do it from a static source or a string. So this reader will just yield a series of bytes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. And then we can use like a limit reader, which is analogous very much to head in the Unix command. So we can say only take the first five bytes from this reader and it'll silently drop the rest of it. The remainder, after it returns the EOF, it's read five bytes, returns an EOF, and the remainder will be left in the underlying reader. So we can use that if we want to kind of stop partway through reading things. Once we have a reader built up, we can copy it out. Um, note copy is backwards, it reads from the thing on the right into the writer on the left. Um, and because we're just wrapping it, it still fulfills the same interface. So any clients of this code don't necessarily need to know that this is happening. For example, if we wanted to do some modifications on the output, like compressing it, we could just add a gzip new writer around it, and that'll compress all the output to standard out. Uh, this is used a lot by us in handling HTTP, right? So if you're taking gzip in requests, you can just wrap your request body in a new gzip reader. None of the rest of your code needs to know about that. If you want to send gzip out, you can just wrap your response writer, which implements writer, in a gzip new writer. Nothing else needs to know about that. Basically free performance. Speaking of HTTP, let's go to our first example here, HTTP chunking. So this comes from some work I was doing at Weave uh, probably about six months ago now. Um, we want to transparently proxy some chunked HTTP in a stream, right? So in a stream, I just mean I don't want to buffer the whole thing at memory at once. I just want to do it piece by piece because it might be really long. So what does transparently mean? By transparently, I mean I don't want to modify any of the data as it goes through. I want to send it exactly byte for byte like the proxy is not even there, so the client can't tell the difference. Um, here's maybe a diagram of it, down at the bottom, bit cut off, we have a client sending requests up to the proxy, uh, and the proxy is forwarding the request, requests up to our server, and then that is responding with a chunked HTTP request. Uh, the friendly ocean wildlife bears no relation to San Francisco tech companies, real or fictitious. Uh, <laughs> so the body of the response is the interesting part here. So an HTTP chunking request looks like this. Uh, each chunk has a hex length, carriage return line feed, and then the actual data. So the first chunk is four bytes long, 
line feed wiki, right? Then we have a five byte long chunk and then a 14 byte long chunk because the chunks are encoded in hex. The body ends with a zero byte long chunk down there. And that's how we know the body is ended. But there's an interesting feature of chunked encoding is that you can have trailers as well, which are like headers, but they're after the body. So you need to stop processing the body once you get that zero length chunk, or you're gonna gobble up the trailers as well. Um, it's useful for things like sending out content MD5s of your data, <clears throat> so you can do it while you stream it. And then the body part of that decodes to Wikipedia new line in chunks. So the chunks can actually contain new lines as well, so you can't just parse for new lines, you need to actually understand the encoding when you're doing it. Clients should, when they're receiving data, should only care about this. They shouldn't care how the data is arranged in the request, right? Uh, some, which bear no relation to San Francisco tech companies, real or fictitious, uh, expect JSON objects to align with the HTTP chunks. The one chunk is one, H <laughs> yeah, one chunk is one JSON object, the next chunk is the next JSON object. So we gotta deal with that, unfortunately. This was me having a sad moment about six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start with the obvious solution that we had initially. Let's just copy the response body, right? We're just getting a byte stream back from the server. We'll just forward that straight on to the client. Um, has a couple problems, right? Won't let us process the trailer separately, and it won't stop after the body. It'll just send the whole thing out. It does keep the framing the same, which is nice. So we can dig around a bit, go through the standard library, um, and find something called an HTTP util chunked reader, which is great. So with that, it's a bit like the gzip reader that we mentioned earlier. It just transparently <laughs> removes all the chunks, puts it in a one stream, so we can get our data out. So that works okay. Um, and it's probably good enough for most of the time, actually. This is probably all you need to do to parse chunk data coming over HTTP. But it streams out the chunking data. So now all we're sending to the client is that Wikipedia in chunks. There's no framing, there's no four bytes, any of that. Our JSON objects won't align with the chunks anymore. And it doesn't actually let us take the body anywhere else, so we can't validate the MD5 as we're doing this, right? We wanna take that trailer and we wanna validate that the body we sent is actually what we should have sent. So let's go into a little bit more involved way of doing this. We need to have a little head scratch, see how we can come up with this. So fortunately, there's something called a T reader in IO. So T reader is an interesting piece. Every time you read from a T reader, it also has a writer in it. And every time you read data through it, that gets siphoned off and writes through the writer as well. So now we can hook our chunked reader up with a copy. And every time our chunked reader pulls data through, it gets siphoned off into the client writer as well. So now any data that's coming into our chunked reader gets verbatim copied to the client. The chunked reader still detects the end of the body, so it'll stop processing once it gets to the trailers. So once the chunk reader stops, the only thing left in the body is the trailers. I was showing this to a colleague of mine when I was prepping for this, and um, they mentioned actually it looks a little bit like a transistor. It's kind of the same idea, right? So you have the main flow through from the response body through to the client writer, and we can use the chunk reader to switch it on and off for the flow. The other advantage of this is that we get the raw data into the digest so we can calculate our MD5 as we go, so we can split stuff out to multiple places. Um, but if we don't care about the digest, we still need to do the copy, right? So we can replace the digest bit with just a discard. Um, in Unix pipes terms, it's like a dev null, right? We still have to do the copy to pull the data through the chunked reader, pull the data through the T reader so it goes to the client writer, but we don't necessarily care about the output. Um, so let's have a think about this code for a minute here. Um, could we implement this in a single reader? What do you guys think? Okay, I hear someone back there saying yes, we could. Would that be more performant or less? Benchmark. Yeah, benchmark it, that is a good answer. Um, when you do that, it basically comes down to the number of copies you're doing, right? So when we're doing this, we're taking the data from the response body reading it through the T-reader, so it's getting copied to the client writer. So that one has to happen, because we need to write it out again, right? But it's also then copying it into the chunked reader and into the discard. So we're doing two copies in this way around. Um, 
if we do it in a single reader, we can just have one. Um, so it is slightly more efficient to do it in one, but it's also significantly more code. Like that's not gonna fit on one slide. <laughs> um, so it's kind of, it's a trade off in that way. Right, let's do an example that is a little bit lighter. So I was doing some build stuff on our build process for Weave um, and needed to run a bunch of subcommands and get the output back from them, which is a fairly common thing in Go. So we basically need to run a bunch of subcommands and we want to multiplex the output back. So we want to give each one a unique prefix so we can tell what's saying what, because if we just interleaved all the output, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, so we're going to run hello world, and we're going to run make, and we're going to run a git status. And then the kind of output we want to get is something like this. So we can see that it's interleaved. So echo started, and then make ran, and then echo kind of finished writing its stuff out, and then git started down at the bottom. We can't just do a string split, because some of these commands actually take, you know, 30, 40 minutes or longer to run, might never return. So we can't just buffer all the output and just split it, right? We need to actually process it as it comes through. So this is kind of the pipeline we want to build, right? So we're going to take the output, split it into lines, prefix it each line, and then merge them back together at the end. That's the kind of stages that we want it to go through. So let's just do a bit of setup here. Um, we're going to start up our list of commands. right? So we have our list of commands at the top. For each one of them, we're going to wire up a prefix writer. This is the thing that we'll implement. And then we're going to set that as the standard out and standard error, standard out and standard error, take a writer. So we can just drop our prefix writer straight in there. And then we're going to wire up the prefix writer to put that just to standard out for now. Um, we could do that to any writer, but standard out's fine for now. And then we'll just start each one asynchronously. So let's have a bit of a look at what prefixing writer is going to look like. So it has kind of an interesting type signature. So it's going to take a prefix, which is our string, and it's going to take an output place to put its writer. So it's wrapping another writer. Similarly to like the gzip new writer we saw earlier, we're going to implement around one of those. And then it's going to return a new writer. And this is the place that the command is going to write. And it'll be processed on the way through the prefixing writer. So any data that goes through this will come out the other side into the output writer with the prefix on each line is the plan. So let's just start a basic implementation of this. So the first bit we need to do in our pipeline is to split stuff on lines as it comes in. Um, and the kind of obvious way to do this is to use a scanner. It's from the buff.io package. So it buffers up the data as it comes in until it gets a line and then flushes that through. So we'll set up a new scanner. The default is actually to scan on lines. Um, I've set it here to be explicit, which is always a good thing. Um, you can also split by UTF-8, runes, words, you can write your own. Uh, it's actually a very flexible tool. And then that lets us iterate over each line as we go through. Yeah, so then we can use a for loop, just like regular Go, to iterate over the lines. And for each one of them, we'll add our prefix on the front. We can just use an fprintf, right? Because it just takes a writer, just like a file, just like a socket. It's very flexible because of the writer interface. And then we'll copy our line in. So we'll just copy the byte straight across into the output. And we'll add a new line. So one of the gotchas with a scanner is that it removes the uh, new lines at the end of each line or the uh, pieces between the tokens. So you need to replace them. Um, and I want to draw your attention to this bit right here, where it says scanner.bytes that we're outputting to the right. Um, there's also a method called scanner.text, which gives you a nice string of the line, right? Um, but that then, of course, is going to allocate a new string, copy the bytes into it, do Unicode handling on them, and a bunch of other performance stuff. So we can gain a little bit here if we're doing quite a lot of data through by just doing a dot bytes. Um, and saves us a bit. There is other ways to split stuff. Um, you could also use something called a buffered reader, and you can do fscanf across them. Um, we're not going to cover that here. It's just throw other ways to do it that you might prefer. Um, they can be slightly shorter code-wise, but a bit less obvious. Um, so let's talk about this bit at the top here, this input. Um, what is input? So this is the thing that will return from prefixing writer. This is the input writer where the command will put its data. Um, 
and you can see we pass it to Buff.io, the new scanner, but new scanner expects a reader. So we need input to both be a reader and a writer. So we need to find a, something that can let us convert those between each other. Um, and of course, IO pipe is pretty much the thing you want for this. So IO pipe gives us two synchronous halves to a read writer. It's similar in some ways to a Chan, right? Um, it gives us a writer half and a reader half. And if a reader shows up and there's no writers, it'll block until there is one. And if a writer shows up saying, hey, I have some data for you, it'll block until a reader is available. Um, so we can use it as sort of a synchronization point. Um, and it means we don't need as much memory internally for buffering and stuff like that. Um, but more importantly, it lets us convert between readers and writers. So we're gonna create our pipe, which is gonna have a pipe writer and a pipe reader. We're gonna pass the pipe reader into the Buff.io scanner, because that's what it expects, and then we're gonna return the pipe writer out of the prefixing writer. So this is the full kind of code. Um, so we'll go through it here. First up, so we have a pipe to connect the reader and writer. We still have our scanner to tokenize the code as before. Um, but note, we've had to move it into a Go routine now so that we can actually return the pipe writer. Um, because scanner.scan blocks on new input, sorry, scanner.scan reads from the pipe, and then the pipe blocks on a writer, we need to actually make sure that it's asynchronously so it can all happen. There are other ways to do this that avoid a Go routine, um, but we will cover them later. So a couple of questions about this code, I guess that we think, uh, could this leak Go routines, do you think? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so the two ways it could block them are if the output blocks indefinitely, or sorry, that it could leak them, is if the output blocks indefinitely, or if the input blocks indefinitely, are two ways it could uh, do that. Are there, how could we avoid leaking Go routines from this? Timeout, yeah, that would work. Uh, we could not use a Go routine. <laughs> that would pretty much avoid it. Uh, so other ways we could do this would be to return a uh, lazy sequence of readers. Um, so if we construct our, for each line, we construct our new output, we can create a reader from that string, like we did in the first slide, the string's new reader, and return a sequence of them. That would avoid it. Um, or we could use a write closer for the output and then close it when we're done. And then once that closes, then we know that the Go routine's done so we can just clean it up that way as well. That would be another way we could avoid it. Um, if we wanted to save the output of the process in the, in the first one, instead of writing to OS standard out, we could use buffers, that kind of thing, right? Other pipes. Um, it's kind of infinitely pluggable at this point. We can kind of wire it together any way we want. And that is all I have for you today. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Slides.